These are your questions related to vehicle dynamics applied to race cars, and now it's time we tackle each of them. Hello everyone, this is Bruno. You sent us many questions related to vehicle dynamics applied to race cars. Now we're going to go through each of them and it's time we discuss the answers together. So let's go to our first question. Should I make a spring or an anti roll bar change to fix car balance? Why and when? Typically, if you're trying to only change mechanical balance, uh, an anti roll bar change will be better because it's more isolated. You're only changing the roll properties of the car, trying to shift the load transfer either more forward if you need more understeer or more reward in case you need more oversteer. If you make a spring change, you'll change many other parameters in the car, such as dynamic ride heights and aero balance. So for example, as you are braking to a corner, you'll have a different amount of movement, meaning that you have a different aero balance at corner entry. At different car speeds, your car will sit at different heights, again changing its aerodynamic properties. Therefore, if you make a spring change, it will also change how much bottoming your car has, because if you run softer, it will change the pitch or the heave and you can start touching the asphalt, and it could even influence your top speed, since you have different ride heights for the front and rear axle. So, when would you do a spring change if the entry roll bar seems to be a much better option to, for changing mechanical balance only? Well, sometimes your entry roll bar will be out of range, so you already have your front entry roll bar, for example, at the stiffest position, your rear entry roll bar either at the softest position or even disconnected, and you don't have any margin for adjustment. It's a very good practice to have your spring selected in a way that you still have range available for the front and rear entry roll bars up and down. Because if your entry roll bars are out of range and you need to ch change springs during the session, you will lose a lot of time. One last consideration is that when you stiffen your entry roll bars, you could compromise your ride behavior even more than the spring. So this is another downside of the entry roll bar. For example, when you go over curbs of, or over bumps on one side, since the entry roll bar is connecting both sides, it will compromise and decrease, for example, your traction capabilities or even cornering capabilities further. So just be careful with running very stiff entry roll bars for that reason. How to define targets for a mechanical trail? Mechanical trail, from the perspective of vehicle dynamics and driver feeling, will be influencing two main parameters. Number one, the total steering torque that the driver is feeling at the steering wheel. It cannot be so high that the driver cannot hold the steering wheel, and it cannot be so low that the steering wheel is not coming back when the driver is releasing the force. The second parameter is steering feedback. So as the driver is steering, it feels a, a steering torque that will decrease. That happens because as you corner, the pneumatic trail of the tire will decrease. Once you are close to the peak grip of the tire, the pneumatic trail will be close to zero, so the driver feels the steering wheel angle a little lighter, and it's an indication that the tire is close to peak grip. While the steering torque is proportional to the total, to the sum of mechanical and pneumatic trail, the steering feedback that we are discussing is actually the proportion between the mechanical trail versus the pneumatic trail. In summary, you need to have a mechanical trail big enough so that the steering is coming back by itself, but on the other hand, you cannot have it so big that the pneumatic trail has no influence on the steering torque, otherwise your driver will have no feeling from the steering wheel. So each type of car and each type of tire will ask for a different range of mechanical trail. So you better learn about your car, do a few iterations so that you can find that. You can do some simple calculations, especially if you have the tire model, and the nomadic trail, otherwise you should test it at the track and work with your driver to find the right number. How do Ackermann and Static Toe change vehicle behavior differently? So let's discuss each of them to understand the differences. For the Ackermann geometry, it is proportional to the steering. So the more you steer, the more difference in steering you will have between the left and right sides. This means that it has different influence on low speed corners, where you have a lot of steering, and high speed corners, where you have really small steering. So in the end, for low speed corners, you have a lot of influence from the Ackermann, while you have pretty much no influence in high speed corners. In the same way, at corner entry, it is not changing anything because you don't have steering wheel angle yet, while at the apex, it's a lot more influential. And when you are at the track, it's hard to make an Ackermann change. Very few race cars allow you to make a change, so you have to work around what you have. 
For the toe, it's a constant value, meaning that you have the same influence for low-speed corners with a lot of steering or high-speed corners. In the same way, you have the same influence at corner entry with very little steering versus at the apex. So you have a constant influence on the tire performance or the axle performance. Another characteristic of toe that could be an ad advantage or disadvantage is that it is always there, even if you have no steering angle. So on the straight lines, you have some sort of toe in or toe out that could generate tire temperature, but at the same time, it will generate some induced drag and reduce your top speed and also generate some wear that you might not want. One of the biggest advantages of toe is that it's easily adjustable. So we are always making changes to the toe on the front or on the rear during a race weekend to achieve what we want. In summary, Ackermann will be proportional to steering and will be more influential at the apex and for low speed corners, while toe is influencing everything. What matters the most is for you to find a combination of Ackermann and toe that will give you ideal performance, meaning a lot of response from the front axle, but enough, enough stability on the rear. In the end, what matters the most is for you to find the ideal combination between Ackermann and toe angle, since in the end, the car is responding to both at the same time. Since you typically cannot change the Ackermann geometry, it is important that you understand it and then find the toe that gives you ideal front axle response. What is the reason for using static camber and why not using only the camber gang from the caster angle? Well, there are a few different reasons why we would still use camber angle even though due to caster we can gain camber as we steer. The first reason is that we only have the caster effect on camber gain on the front axle since we have steering and not on the rear axle. The second reason is that the camber gain coming from the caster is only influential when you have a lot of steering angle. This means that for low speed corners, we do gain a lot of camber because of the caster, since we have a lot of steering wheel angle. However, for high speed corners, we have minimal steering, meaning that we don't recover as much camber on the outside tire as we need. The same is valid for corner entry versus the apex. So at corner entry, you have very little steering wheel angle. Therefore, you don't gain as much camber as you could want. You would need to wait until the apex until you have this camber. And many times you do want to have camber at corner entry, because if you add camber to the front axle, you might get more response, or if you add camber to the rear axle, you might get more stability. In summary, by running higher caster angle on the front axle, you can decrease the static camber, but as we saw, it does not remove the need of static camber. How can I adjust damper bump and rebound to affect the car balance? So, first we need to understand in which phases of the corner the damper will be the most influential. Damper is proportional to speed, therefore we need roll speed in order for the damper to have any effect on the dynamics of the car. Meaning that when you are in corner entry and you have some roll speed, or at corner exit, the dampers will be the most influential in terms of vehicle handling. Now, at the apex, where you have a more stable condition, it is not having any influence on the load transfer. Of course, with the bumps on the road, it will influence the vertical load variation that you get, but not in terms of lateral load transfer. This means that the damper will be effective at defining corner entry and exit behavior. Now, how does it change the, the vehicle behavior? The damper can change the lateral load transfer distribution in transient. So when you are cornering, you will have low transfer on the front and on the rear. If you adjust your dampers, you could get more low transfer on the front or more on the rear, which will change vehicle balance. Typically, the axle that you transfer more load, you will decrease the grip on that axle, even though for a corner entry, it could be a little different. If you have more camber or depending on the toe that you have, you, would get, you could get a, an opposite behavior um, to what I just mentioned. So it is very important that you test at the track to understand what the damping is doing to your vehicle balance at entry. Now, how do you work with bump and rebound? Well, both of them will influence the vehicle behavior. What you have to have in mind is that if you are changing the bump, it will affect the outside tire. If you change the rebound, it will affect the inside tire. But both tires are defining the final balance of the vehicle. So if you're only changing, if you're only trying to change the transient load transfer and you want to simplify the issue, I would think more about what axle am I changing? And then I change bu both bump and rebound. Then if I should focus on the bump or rebound specifically. Well, if you want to go a little bit more advanced, then you can think, okay, I'm gonna change only bump or only rebound. 
But then in that, in that case, you have to also keep in mind what other changes in terms of ride performance you will get as you make this asymmetrical change. And also what differences in, for example, braking or traction you will get. How does the steering rack position affect the row center height? Well, if you're using the very simple calculations of the row center position, which is basically the intersection between the planes of the wishbones, it will have no influence since you're not taking the steering rack or the toe link into account. However, if you do the proper calculation, for example, the one that we use in our software, Optimum Kinematics, changing the steering rack will indeed change the row center height. First, we should know that the row center height is defined by the instant center. The instant center is the point around which the wheel is rotating. If you change the steering rack, even though the vertical movement of the tire seems like it's not changing, the tire will have a different bump steer and the wheel will move in a slightly different way. If the wheel is moving differently and you have some sort of rotation, the instant center position will change. If the instant center position will change, the row center height will also change. In summary, by changing the steering rack position, you change the bump steer, the bump steer controls the movement of the wheel, which will then change the instant center and therefore the row center is also affected. We give real examples of what happens when you, when you change the steering rack position in our suspension design series, episodes two and three, and you can find the, the link to that series in the video description. How does differential lock affect balance on power in corner exit? In simple terms, more differential lock means more locking torque, basically how much torque the differential can sustain between left and right sides. For corner exit, more locking torque makes, it, makes the differential capable of transferring more of the torque to the outside tire if the system is asking for it. Meaning that as you are going back on throttle and you are above the preload, you should be shifting more of the torque to the outside tire, generating more rotation. However, this is not an active differential, meaning that the torque is not automatically transferred to the outside tire. It only means that if this dynamic system is asking for more torque on the outside tire, it can, the differential can provide that, typically giving more oversteer behavior or more rotation. Now, once the differential is locked, so let's say that when you are 60% or 70% power or on throttle, the differential is already locked, increasing the locking torque even further will not change anything. Once the differential is locked, it doesn't matter what you change, the two wheels are rotating already at the same speed. The question was about corner exit, but if you are interested in corner entry and the influence of differential preload, we have a whole video about that subject in our performance engineering series. You can find the link to that video in the video description. When is it better to increase the spring rate to increase grip? Typically, increasing the spring rate will not directly help the grip of the tire. That happens because we'll generally get more load variation, so as you are driving over bumps, the load is varying more, which we know decreases the tire grip. However, there are a few specific situations where we increasing the spring rate um, will actually help you achieve more grip. The first one is in terms of driver feeling or low transfer speed. Sometimes you need more support, you need less camber variation, you need um, faster load transfer and a more and a faster um, response of the car. In that case, increasing the spring stiffness will make the car easier to drive for your driver, especially if you were running a very soft car at the high level um, racing series. And in that case, the driver, stiffer spring will not give you higher grip, but it will help you, your driver exploit that grip. Another situation where running stiffer springs would increase the grip would be if you need more um, aerodynamics, meaning that you want to run the car lower. And also keep in mind that you are also lowering the CG. In order for you to run the car lower, you will need stiffer springs so that you can keep uh, or so that you can have a higher level of platform control and avoid the car from bottoming and touching the asphalt. Besides that, with stiffer springs, you get less aero balance variation. So as you are braking under traction or at different corner speeds where your car is sitting at different heights, a stiffer spring will help you maintain your balance more constant. So this can also be a powerful tool to provide the balance your driver needs in different parts of the track. Increasing the spring rate could also have some contribution in tire temperature. It could have a small influence on increasing tire temperature. So you should also keep that in mind, even though you should test if that is a really, if that really is an effective parameter on your specific car. So these were some examples of situations that increasing spring rate could help you achieve more grip. So these were the answers to your vehicle dynamics questions applied to race cars. 
If you'd like to submit more questions like these, you can send them to our Instagram profile. If you're interested in this type of content, you would like our seminars. We have a seminar fully dedicated to applied vehicle dynamics, where we're discussing these questions and a whole lot more throughout many days. And we have also our performance engineering seminar, where we tackle how to optimize the car performance based on data. Besides that, Optimum G offers the following services. Performance engineering, where you could have one of our performance engineers at the track with you. Vehicle Dynamics Consulting, where we'll help you with Vehicle Dynamics and Tire Development, and also Simulation Software in the areas of Kinematics, Dynamics and Tires. Thank you for watching the video, and I'll be waiting for your next questions.